All right, y'all, we're getting ready to go live right now. Um, Evan, go ahead. Hit the intro. Welcome to Be Her Talk, an award-winning talk show that adds a taste of hip-hop, a side of Shakur, and spice to unflavored news. I'm super happy to see everyone today. Hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, each Sunday we here at Be Her Talk, we talk race, politics, and culture from an unapologetic Black millennial perspective. And for the next several weeks, we'll be focusing on the 2020 election and its impact on the Black, Black community with our official media sponsor, Black Enterprise. My name is Selena Hill, and I'm the digital editor at Black Enterprise and the founder of Be Heard Talk. I'm super excited to be here with you all today to talk about a new unapologetically black and radical political organization called Our Black Party, which centers the voices and needs of the black community. So in the second half of the show, we'll speak exclusively with the national co-chairs of Our Black Party, Candace Hollingsworth and Dr. Wes Bellamy. But for now, let me kick it back to my co-host, Stanley Fritz, to introduce himself. Hey, what's going on, beautiful people? This is Stanley Fritz, your favorite engineer on the PC One <laughs> Confused. When I'm not spending my, my time annoying Selena or making mixtapes, I'm working full-time as a political operative and political director at Citizen Action of New York. You can follow me on Twitter at Stan Fritz. You can follow me on IG at Stan Fritz. You can follow me on Snapchat at Dark Skin Swindle, but I don't really go there, so don't show up there. Talk to me nicely, y'all. And I also want to introduce our very special correspondent, Evan Mastronardi, who will be joining us for the first half of the show, where we talk about the news roundup, the news stories that made us laugh, cry, or just really upset. So Evan, welcome back to the show. It's been a while. Thank you. It's always amazing to be on Be Her Talk. I'm Evan Mastronardi, co-founder of Let's Not Be Trash.com. Uh, space for multidimensional masculinity. Of course, my other co-founders here as well, Stan Fritz. Uh, you could check us out on our podcast, our website. We got multiple media content. Follow me at, at underscore Mastronardi. And it's always good to have a conversation with y'all. Oh, of course. And I just want to let everyone know we will be taking and reading comments throughout the whole show. Shout out to everyone who is watching us right now on our official media sponsors Facebook page, Black Enterprise. Leave those comments. You can also leave them on be Heard Talk. And you can also tweet us at Be Heard Talk and we will read and take as many comments as we can. Stanley? Yeah, man. Leave your comments, leave your questions, leave your curse words. Don't put your curse words on live radio though because we don't do that. But have a great conversation with us. And since now I do have the moment to take over the microphone from the illustrious Selena Hill, I gotta tell you, I'm excited to talk about some good things, some real good things. And how do we do that? We do that during our news roundup, where we talk about all the things that made you laugh, cry, curse, flip a table, maybe tweet something that got you quoted in a newspaper and you kind of regret it, but you don't really, and break down what's going on all over the country. And to start things off, I really do think we need to take a quick moment to be somber and honest about one of the biggest stories happening right now. And to help to contextualize the story, I have a clip I want to play for you guys. In case you guys don't know what that clip comes from, it is from the Sledge Sisters. It's called I'm So Excited and I Just Can't Hide It. And why is that? Well, Meg Thee Stallion performed at SNL last night and she did a great clip. Did you guys see Meg's performance on Saturday Night Live and the middle skit that she did for Breonna Taylor and calling out Daniel Cameron, the Black District Attorney in Kentucky? Selena, what did you think? Yeah, about no. SNL? Right? killed it first off i want to say when i was watching the debate i could only imagine how epic saturday night live would be last night because of the cold and the cold open because i knew they were going to mock the debate jim carrey killed it but yes megan the stallion her performance was so powerful she did a tribute to black women and called for 
us as a society to protect black women now she did that in the middle of performing savage all of a sudden you heard like 10 gunshots and then you heard malcolm x talking about you know the famous line right that famous speech where he talks about black women being the most disrespected people in society and then you hear tamika mallory's voice who's a friend to the show um she talked when you know that clip where she was talking about daniel cameron again he's the uh, attorney general in kentucky and she said that he was just as bad as the negroes that sold black people into slavery mm -hmm. centuries ago I mean, it was so good. I, I think that it definitely spe spoke to the temperament of our time, um, the zeitgeist, if you will. Um, the choreography was on point. Um, and also like those bullet shots, honestly, I think that was a swipe at Tory Lanez because we know she was shot in her feet by Tory Lanez who put out an album denying the whole thing. So shout out to Meg. Evan, have you been having as good of a weekend as I've been having? It's been a really positive weekend. What did you think about SNL? I'm very sorry to have missed SNL, but I do need to catch up on that. Um, I haven't actually seen SNL in a while, but this is definitely an important event to see. Uh, I kind of saw SNL live when I saw the debate itself, because the debate was a parody of itself. I mean, but I, I want to see how it was done, and I definitely want to see Meg Thee Stallion's powerful performance and call out of all those really important things. Am I having a good weekend? Listen, I try not to laugh at other people's pain. Um, but it's very hard for me to uh, accept the biblical principles that we as kings try to hold ourselves to, Stanley, because like, man, this guy getting COVID, I know we're going to get to that later, but there's something just so uh, tragically comedic about it. So I'm, I'm trying to temper my, my excitement there. I can't hear you, Evan. Something's happening. I don't know what this is. Oh, oh so sorry, folks. Sorry. I had some music playing in the background. I don't know how it got there. Um, let's get focused again. Breaking news, as you guys all know, Donald Trump caught COVID. But not only Donald Trump, Chris Christie, Kellyanne Conway, Jim Miller, and a whole bunch of other people within the Trump stratosphere. And I think this news isn't just the biggest news of the year. It is also the most obvious news of the year. Because as we know, the Trump administration has gone out of their way not to wear face masks. Even so, as on Chris Wallace of Fox News told us, even though everyone was required to get a test and had a temperature check before they came to the debate stage, the Trump team purposely came late so they could miss the test and then sat in the crowd with no face mask on. And since we found out Trump had COVID, which was a news that broke at around Stanley, can you repeat that last part? It sounded like you were going in and out a little bit. Sure. I said, since we found out that Donald Trump has had COVID Thursday at one o'clock in the morning, we have also learned because of his doctors and his unorganized staff that he may have been having symptoms as early as Friday. And that they knew this. And even though they knew this, they were still out traveling, being public with people, wearing face. Okay, Stanley. So, right, we're having a lot, we're having a hard time hearing you, but um, I do want to just chime into just like the Trump disaster with COVID, right? It seems like it was either spread at this super event or Trump himself might be a super spreader himself. I mean, first of all, I'm sure. Yeah, no, of course. Like, we all remember how he was mocking Hillary Clinton when she had the flu. Then we all recall just days ago, he was mocking. Joe Biden for wearing a mask that he said, oh, he has the biggest mask ever and like mask shaming him. And now his family comes to the debate. They take yeah. their mask off, which defied protocol and the rules at that debate. And we find out days later that the family, at least two of them, has have actually come down with COVID. Look, I'll say this as ironic as it is, it's like science just met karma and i, I got that quote from snl last night too that, that, that's that's, that's pretty all good. it is science meets karma look i know a lot of people you know barack obama and a number of people on the on the left have expressed thoughts and prayers for him but i'm i'm really concerned about the two hundred thousand people in this country who have covid and the thousands who are suffering because their family a family member died from covid 
Listen, it's just yeah, not it's fair. Everybody. And we know that Trump exasperated this pandemic by not taking leadership and not taking action and immediately downplaying the severity of this pandemic. Listen, Selena, right. okay. I'm not too stressed about Trump getting COVID because people get COVID every day. 200,000, not a big deal, as he said at the debate. So 200,000 COVID cases wasn't too bad. I guess 200,001 isn't a big deal either. Good luck to him. But people have had some mixed reactions. Some folks on the left have been wishing him well and hoping he recovers. And some folks have been criticizing those people for wishing him well because they say he's a fascist. Where do you stand on this, Evan? Well, a few things. First of all, Barack Obama may have typed what he needs to type because, you know, he's, he's a gentleman and a man of good character. But the second, I know the first time he heard it, you, you know when Merrill really finds something funny on Jesus and Mary and he falls out the chair? All right, that's what Barack Obama did when he heard it, when Donald Trump got COVID. All right, that's the first thing. So I don't care what he wrote. I know Barack Obama was laughing on the inside. Did we forget Herman Cain died? I mean, this is his friend. This is Donald Trump's fr friend. Who knows if Donald Trump actually got friends? So this, and he, and he goes on stage mocking people wearing a mask. A mask may have saved your friend. It's amazing to me. This man has no morals. So do I, do I have genuine remorse for this man right now? First of all, he's going to get the best attention. He's going to get the type of medical attention everybody wished they could get. Those other 200,000 people that you were talking about, they're not getting that type of attention. So I'm not that worried about Donald Trump's obese, I, I guess we can't curse here, but filet fish self. I'm not too worried about him right now. I think he'll be okay. So, and, and should we should we criticize people who are wishing him well? They're doing what you're supposed, they're doing respectability politics. That's what you're supposed to do. No matter what you feel, that's what you're supposed to say. So no, I don't criticize them for wishing him well, but I'm just gonna say straight up, like, like you said, uh, Selena, it is science meets karma. And like you said, Stanley, 200,000 people got COVID. This is 200,001. So why should I act any any more different about it? Yeah, that's pretty that's pretty real. Selena, I know a lot of folks are saying they're praying for him. They're going to protest to, to actions to show support for him. There was a big action in Staten Island where there were a bunch of people wishing him well and all those people were not wearing face masks. Will you be going to one of those actions to wish the president well? Oh, Cyrus W. Of course, of course not, Stanley. Please, all those people in Staten Island. See, I saw this funny tweet. Somebody said, "This is why New Yorkers regret the Verrazano Bridge." Not only is it the most expensive bridge I think in the country, but it leads to Staten Island. Um, I don't know what it will take to get people to take science and the COVID pandemic seriously. It has literally disrupted the entire world. And I, it, it literally behooves me the amount of stupidity we have. And it reminds me how and why we elected a leader like Donald Trump. If you have people rallying around him for support without masks, knowing that the way he got the virus and probably spread the virus is because he refused to wear masks so oftentimes, like what, what does it take? Like, I don't, I don't understand at this point. I don't. Well, actually, yeah, some people are saying some people are saying that Trump has learned his lessons and he's going to come back a more serious president and take care of things. Do you think that's true? And Evan, do you think that him catching oh, no. or hurt his election? So sorry, let's, get first. let's get to Selena first. Do you think it's true that Trump will take this more seriously now? Um. I don't know, because I think that there's a few different scenarios, right? Um. He may, if he beats it, because he has the best care in the world, then he may say, look, I beat the virus. The country's going to beat the virus. I made, I gave a vaccine. I got a cure. I was cured. Like he can use this to boast about himself because we know he's a narcissist and he makes everything about himself. Um, that may happen. Um, you know, it, it could happen that, I don't know. Like I have no hope. I just have no hope. No. And Evan, do you think that him and his entire team pretty much catching COVID is going to hurt or help his election. When Ronald Reagan got shot in his, like his first month as president, his approval ratings went way up. Is the same thing going to happen for Trump? Yes, it will. Because here's what's going to happen. Just like impeachment, he's going to come through it and he's going to say, look, I beat it. It's nothing. I could take it down myself. Of course, 
not putting aside the putting aside the fact that he will get uh, the medical care that no one else will get because he's the president of the United States. People will look at it like, I mean, they think of Donald Trump as a, a Greek god when it comes to physique, which is abjectly hilarious. But the man eats flayed or fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But I mean, if the people there think, well, if Donald Trump can do it, you know, they're not thinking even that if an old obese man can do it. They're, they're thinking if their leader could do it, you know what? He's going to lead us through this too. So, of course, they will come through it stronger. There is no linear thought on this side. There is no logic here. Not, nothing good will come from him getting COVID other than the memes. Uh, Selena, you have a comment you want to read to us. Go ahead. ahead. Absolutely. So we're getting a comment on Black Enterprises Facebook Live. Paul Tapper Young says, how are 207,000 people who died of COVID-19, some of them who could not afford health care, 42 businesses closed in 2020? You're absolutely right. You have people who couldn't even afford health care. And we know that COVID-19 disproportionately affected Black and Brown communities because of lack of, lack of access to health care. And like you said, in businesses, you know, and, and just juxtapose that with the type of care and treatment uh, that Donald Trump is getting, plus his dismissal and how he's trivialized this entire pandemic from day one. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing really has been trivialized. They have not taken it seriously. They have not been on a level. Speaking of people not taking something seriously and not being on a level with folks, District Attorney Daniel Cameron in Kentucky, we talked about him briefly when we were talking about Meg Thee Stallion's performance at, the, um, at SNL, but now it's come to light that Daniel Cameron did not even put murder or manslaughter or any charges against the cops for shooting Breonna Taylor in his grand jury hearings. And folks on the grand jury have been demanding that this be made public because they didn't get a chance to. Daniel Cameron tried to delay this, the release of the information, he failed. And now we know for a fact that they didn't even put it on, on a table. Selena, as someone who followed this case very closely, as somebody who was very impacted by the negative um, decision from the grand jury, how do you feel about this? Um, and you know, we talked about this last week in the show. Very disheartened, frustrated, tired, and again, not surprised. Um, we know that Daniel Cameron has very close ties to the Republican Party. Mitch McConnell was at his wedding. He spoke at the RNC. Um, he has shown himself to be um, just inhumane when it comes to his own people. But to me, he's trying to find that validation from white people and the people around him, if, just to be frank. I think that the fact of the matter that he did not, um, you know, and um, he actually did not put murder charges on the table for the two police officers that were actually, uh, that killed Breonna Taylor. And the fact that he didn't even give the jury that option. And then he was like kind of blaming it, blaming it on the jury by saying, oh, well, they could have decided to pursue um, charges against all three uh, officers if they wanted to. No. First of all, they need to release the part of the tape where the prosecutors are actually addressing the jury and giving their recommendations and suggestions. That part has not been released, even though 15 hours of the uh, grand jury um, proceedings have been. So I really can't even trust it at this point. To me, if you act, it's been a, it's, it's lack transparency from the very beginning. Um, I think that there's definitely been like a lot of conspiracy about this to protect the police officers. And again, shame on Daniel Cameron. Yeah, absolutely shame on Daniel Cameron. T Tamika said it perfectly. Mm -hmm. Not all skin folk are kin folk, and he obviously is not kin folk. Evan, what did you think about this this new news? None of it is surprising. Yeah. The wall got <laughs> more justice than Breonna Taylor got. That's that's what was clear. The the only real charge was about endangering a neighbor, not even her. It does not surprise me that from the start, this was not going to yield anything close to justice. I did not trust him. The fact that he took so long to even uh, get those uh, charges out there for an indictment to even come out, uh, given a, a case that was such clear injustice towards her and her boyfriend, uh, to me from the start set the tone that we were not going to get justice for Brianna. This was not, I, I can't even say this was the baseline. I can't even say this was superficial. It barely even fit that definition. Um, but the only thing we could ask for at this point is more and more transparency. So people who are that much uh, out of the loop, I don't know how you could be at this point, 
but can see textually with the indictment, with as, as, as you were saying, with the video of the prosecutor, just how much of a separate justice system we have. If you're not already woken up to see that, more video evidence showing it at this point is the only thing that I guess we can get out of this. Yeah, Ashley, we have a comment. I want you to get to it. Yeah, okay. So Greg Hall left a comment on Black Enterprises Facebook page. He says, it was a setup from the beginning. I agree with Greg. Yeah, absolutely was a setup and everything we're seeing right now tells us that it was a setup and that there was never any good intention behind this. Speaking of setup, there was a protest that happened in Mott Haven in the Bronx a couple of months ago and people complained significantly about the police's reaction. At the time, activists on the ground, reporters, and even some staff members of New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio were saying that the police purposely boxed people in, told them to get out of the streets and then attacked them. Well, the Human Rights Commission just did a, a study on that protest. And what they're now saying is that the police purposely did this. They talked to over 81 people, including reporters, staff members of de Blasio who, was at, who were at that protest and other police officers. And everything they're seeing tells them that the cops set up the protesters so that they could then attack and assault them. What that tells me is what I've already known is that the police is pretty much a paramilitary force committed to committing statewide and state sanctioned violence on people. Evan, hearing this news, you're a Bronx guy. How do you feel about it? I'm not surprised. This happened in early June. And when I first heard about it, this is exactly what I heard. And Selena's sent it to me yesterday because I didn't actually see the report. But when she mentioned it to me, I'm like, oh, that sounds like what happened in early June. And then that's exactly what it was. But it was just proving through other firsthand sources and investigations what I already knew that they were corralled into this space and then beaten and arrested at a hundreds and hundreds of clip. And I can tell you, this is not, I mean, you know, but for anyone who this is surprised to, this is not a localized NYPD thing. When I went to DC for the March on Washington, that's what almost happened to us. At a certain point when we were outside the White House, we started hearing whistles. We heard whistles from both sides. By the way, every single police vehicle known to man was there. It was like a bike, a motorbike, a helicopter, an SUV, a car, the three world stupid looking cars the NYPDs have. It was all at one place. And we saw them coming from both sides. And me and my friend were like, this is how they do it. Let's get out of here. So thankfully it didn't devolve into what happened in the Bronx, but this is a very common tactic. It's they want to arrest people. They want to beat people. This helps a narrative that people are unruly. They want to increase those numbers. So none of this was surprising that in Mott Haven, they literally created a situation that people would be arrested. It's not that people were just disobedient. Selena, you went to a couple of protests. This could have easily been one of those you were at. How does that make you feel? No, you're absolutely right. Police are terrorists in many sense. Um, you know, to your point about the, the report. Um, so during that particular incident, 236 people were arrested. And according to Human Rights Watch, 61 were injured by police. Some were left with broken noses and fingers. They lost teeth. Some have potential nerve damage. Like, they were literally brutalizing protesters. And a number of the protesters said that the, the protest was completely peaceful until the cops showed up. And how many times have we seen this over and over again where you have these peaceful protests and the cops go there and they antagonize? It, it's just, look, we've talked about this on Be Heard before. It's time to defund the police. They, I, we can't trust them in our communities. They're not doing our job. They're there to terrorize. They're there to make a quota. They're there to arrest people. The training is not working. Yeah, it's not working. Well, that's my point of it. Evan, do you also think it's time to defund the police? Oh, oh let me just add, Stanley. Sure. Um, police Commissioner Damat Shea described this plan, and I quote, he said, it, a plan which executed nearly flawlessly. So it sounds like they were doing the job that they were sent to do. Yeah. Of, of yeah. course, it's time to defund the police. It's time to reimagine what, what the hell we even think policing is. Because as it stands now, it, it, there's this is something that needs to be uh, restructured from the root, not just the branches. I mean, of course, we need to defund and reallocate money, but it's more than that, because whatever is left of this system will have this type of poison in it. We need to figure out how to have some type of security force, and I'm calling it that, I don't even know what we're going to call in the future, that does not have 
this type of white supremacist uh, ideology that has better sort of functioning, that doesn't have the history it has, but that's for a whole other conversation. But the simple question is, of course, we need to defund it. And like Selena said, you know, it's amazing how many good cops can there truly be? And I used good term good loosely because it's such an abstract term. If we saw what happened there where hundreds of people got arrested and brutalized basically for being peaceful and for being uh, boxed in and someone said it worked flawlessly. And that's the person that all the rest of the cops take their cues from. So how could this system at all have a majority of decent officers who are qualified to do their job if their leader is saying that this brutality was flawless? You know, Joe Biden says that he doesn't want to defund the police, that he wants to give the police more money because they don't have enough resources. Selena, does that kind of talking point kind of discourage you from wanting to support Biden? No. <laughs> I mean, we have, you know, on the other end, we have Donald Trump who literally put out dog whistles to the Proud Boys um, during the debate. Uh, no, I mean, it, it's no question. I, it, it doesn't excite me. I'll, I'll say that I'm not running enthusiastically to the polls to vote for Biden, but I'm certainly not discouraged and I would not discourage anyone from voting for Biden. It's, you know, the, close, the, the choice is clear. What we as progressives and those of us on the left need to continue to do is it is up to, to us to push Democrats and those who claim to represent us to actually uh, move on policy, legislation, and politics that would better protect and serve our community. I mean, yeah, we say that, but like Biden's going to come in. He's got Kamala as VP, who's a cop. What kind of pushing are we going to need to do in order to get them to give up the program? Um, I just want to say, look, far from me to defend much of what Biden was saying, even though he clearly was is the better option. But I do think some of this is also terminology. I mean, he's not clearly going to go as far as maybe we are on this panel, even AOC would. But Biden just doesn't want to say the word defund the police. Because mm -hmm. if he says the word defund the police, he knows he's going to lose a million votes. He's, he's going next to Donald Trump, who thinks he's trying to pit Biden as a socialist, which is hilarious, because I wish he was half the time, mm -hmm. but he's not. Um, so in that debate, I don't think it's the best representation of, of what Biden's actually saying. Biden actually said, right after he said, not defund the police, he said, we need to give funds to put psychiatrists on the scene. I'm like, yes, that's what we want. We want that type of stuff. So some of this is terminology. He's not going to go as far as he wants, but he's also just not going to say the words defund the police because he knows what that triggers in a lot of white America's head even if at least a small slice of what he is actually saying is when he says give more resources, some of those resources are nonviolent, non-weapon holding people like psychiatrists, like social workers. He is actually open to that stuff. He's just not going to say that word on a debate stage with Donald Trump. I don't know, man. I'm voting for Biden because I also prefer to have someone who can at least complete a sentence over a white supremacist who can't even who can't complete a sentence or keep himself healthy. But the fact of the matter is the police have proven themselves to be a group of roided up white supremacists who enjoy punching walls, punching their wives, and punching and shooting black people. So why is anyone in any position of leadership still trying to support the cops? There's no such thing as a good or bad apple anymore. The whole tree is rotten. And like you pointed out, Evan, we got to tear it out from the root. So like, why, why are we even having this conversation anymore? It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. There's there's just not going to have, we live in a country that public support matters. It's not just about what's right. If it's about what's right, I'm with you 100%. But yeah. as long as we have elected officials, as long as we got, or we're still voting for people, they're going to think about what the reaction to certain statements are. They're not going to say that stuff. Hell, even I bet even AOC wouldn't necessarily say she wants to abolish the police entirely because she knows she has people that got to vote for her. So this is, this is what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the reaction to these statements. Yeah. I guess you're right. Well, folks, that was news roundup. Thank you so much. Oh, Stanley, I think we lost you a little bit, but um, thank you so much, Evan, for joining us for the first half of Be Her Talk, the news roundup. Your input in, is always insightful. We enjoy your perspective. And shout out to the folks who are still watching us on Facebook Live, Twitter, as well as LinkedIn. We're now going to switch gears a little bit and invite our uh, main featured guest onto the show. And I actually wanna start this segment by saying this, uh, for decades, black voters have not felt represented by either of the two major political parties. 
Many say Republicans have pushed in a super right-leaning agenda that has jeopardized the Black community, while Democrats take the Black vote for granted. However, a new political organization called Our Black Party is demanding that the Black vote is earned and that elected officials represent the specific interests of Black communities. This organization exists to advance a political agenda that addresses the needs of Black people. Their goal is to build a network of Black community leaders inside and outside of the political system and to push an unapologetically Black agenda. So without further ado, we have with us the national co-chairs of our Black Party. We have Candace Hollingsworth and Dr. Wes Bellamy. And they're gonna talk to us about what inspired them to launch this political organization, who will benefit from it, and what impact it may have on the 2020 elections now and politics at large. And let me add that Candace is the mayor of um, Hyattsville in Maryland, and Wes served as vice mayor of Charlottesville, Virginia, and is a former Charlottesville city councilman who also co who also chairs the political science department at Virginia State University. Welcome to the show, guys. Virginia State representing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you again, Wes. I don't know if you remember, you you and I did a panel together at the National Urban League last yeah. year when things were actually open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were out in Indianapolis. Good to see you again, Brother Stanley. What's up? I'm glad you got the uh, the title on my sister, uh, Candace. Yeah. I always tell her, it's Mayor Hollinsworth. You know what I'm saying? She yeah. don't like when I do that. She don't like when I do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm super, super happy to have you guys here. I actually want to start this conversation by asking, what is our Black Party and what is it that you're looking to accomplish? So I think Wes is deferring to me. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having us here. Um, it's always an honor to be able to talk about this project, this initiative, this movement that we're building. Um, and I like when I talk about our Black Party, I like to use my words because it's easier for me to remember it that way. And it, I feel like it conveys the what I feel is the power of what we're building. And for me, our Black Party is a political organization that is established to change the laws and the lawmakers that undermine Black, exist, black existence. So that means changing policies, but also if there are folks who are in office that are not doing what we need them to do, with regard to passing policies, passing laws and legislation, then we change them too. And so I think um, the work that we're doing, this is just the beginning, but I'm so excited about where we're gonna be going from here. Um, uh, Dr. West, tell us what are some of the short-term and long-term goals of our Black Party? Yeah, sure. So our Black Party, as Candace alluded to, we're focused on making sure that the needs of Black people are met and they're centered as a whole. We have an array of different goals. So when we're looking at long-term goals, we're looking to bring forth a thousand new Black elected officials by the year 2024. And when we say a thousand new Black elected officials, we mean a thousand new Black elected officials who are committed to ensuring that Black folk have equity. Because we know, and as we've seen over recent weeks and just over time as a whole, all skin folk ain't kin folk. So we want to ensure that Black folk are represented, not only on the local level, on the statewide level, but also on the federal level. We are committed to ensuring that there's a sense of political training. So whether that's like a politics one-on-one -on -one, to ensure that everybody, whether you're an elected official, you understand how to advocate for policies that are advantageous for black folk. Whether you're thinking about running for office, we wanna make sure that you understand the do's and don'ts. And then if you don't have any um, ideology or, or understanding of what politics is currently like, we wanna make sure that you're, uh, you understand that as well. And then in addition to that, when we look at across all 50 states, we have a goal of ensuring that every state has a chief equity officer that serves in the governor's cabinet. And that individual will have uh, power and authority to, to ensure that state laws are being passed through what we call an equity lens. And then also we're looking at on, loca on the local level, we want to create commissions to ensure that African-Americans, the needs of African-Americans and black folk as a whole are met. So, I mean, we have, we have tons of goals and different initiatives. You can find more about what we're looking to do on www.ourblackparty.org. And we need you to join us. You want to know more? You want to tap in? Come on, sign up. Let's get it. Uh, Mayor Hollingsworth, um, you know, when we speak of the Black agenda, 
what does that mean? What does, how do you define a black agenda and is reparations a part of the agenda you're pushing? Absolutely. So the, our black party has adopted as kind of the beginning framework or platform for the black agenda, black agenda 2020 that was developed by black to the future action fund, which is an arm of black futures lab. So that organization did a couple years ago, a black census, which is the first census of African-Americans in this country since reconstruction. And through that, they surveyed over 30,000 black people and compiled all of that information to be able to develop an agenda that states, that puts forward the legislative um, platform for black people that would improve the quality of life for black people. And number one in that agenda is of course, paying attention to where we are it within this moment, which is HR 40, that is the thing that most that we're kind of talking about is at least studying what it should look like. So that is the first item within that agenda, which is to study um, reparations and what that needs to look like um, in this country. But as a party, we are certainly committed to um, seeing a vision for reparations for black people uh, come to fruition and through the ways that we're able to develop that within the systems that exist. Sister Candace, real quick, um, this is a question on a reparations piece. So there's been a lot of like debate online, at least from folks um, from ADOS, um, American descendants of slavery who say that any reparations that comes needs to go to them first. Um, I say them because I'm Haitian. So my lineage goes back to Haiti and Dominica. Um, that's caused some friction in the movement. Where do you guys stand on that? So I think we have not spoken specifically among the group of us around um, making a distinction between African descendants of slaves and black people writ large. But what we know is that African descendants of slaves are those who are most immediately impacted by the legacy of slavery in this country because there are centuries of exclusion and also centuries of laws that were intentionally developed to, to um, undermine black people who were descendants of slaves in this country. By the same token though, we have to acknowledge that there is diaspora within the, within the black community. And that although we recognize the distinctions within our communities and we celebrate and acknowledge the diversity within the black community, when it comes to white supremacy being the thing that we are against, we know that white folks look at all of us in the very same way. And so we all end up having the same, um, dealing with the same, the same legacies of slavery and white supremacy on a daily basis. And so for us, that's why it is a big hand with regard to having reparations, but also ongoing and daily po and policies that impact the daily lives of black people in this country. So it's, we have to look at the totality of what the ex black experience is in the United States. Thank you so much. And another thing is, we're, we're talking about a party. So um, for those of you who don't know, I am um, a member and a huge advocate of the Working Families Party, which is a third party that started in New York. And now they have chapters in about 19 different parts of the, of the country, 19 different states. They're not on a ballot line in every state, but I would argue that so far in this moment, they're the most legitimate third party in the country. What's the path to making a strong third party? And do you think there's some obstacles when Black-led third party groups try to do it? You want me to take that one, Candice? Wes, you go ahead and I'll add in if necessary. Yeah, sure. So I think there, when individuals think about Working Families Party, WFP, and, and shout out to everybody who's rocking with WFP, y'all are doing phenomenal work. Um, I think that one distinction between us and WFP is that while we look at, when we when we look at Working Families Party, and again, it's a group who we have a, a utmost respect for, a great deal of respect for, it's more of a multicultural approach. While we're looking at considering specifically black folk and not even considering, we're talking about the needs being addressed specifically for our people. And while we have love and uh, we, we show love to our white brothers and sisters, um, Latinos, our Latinx brothers and sisters, Asian brothers and sisters, Irish, Jewish, whatever ethnicity or however you identify, there is a time for black folk to make sure that we ensure that the needs of our people are met specifically. And when we look at how we do that and how we carry that out, part of it of which is believing that we are good enough to in fact do this on our own. So when we think about obstacles as you raised, I think that's one component of it. But we do know specifically when you look across the country, there's a, a wide array of people, specifically black folk, 
who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they want something specifically for us. And that's where we think we come into play. And when we look at other barriers and things of that nature, we firmly believe that black folk, whenever we put our mind to something, whenever we're organized, whenever we collectively move forth with the plan, we are unstoppable. And that's where we are right now with putting this together. We are currently having state caucus calls uh, with a goal of reaching all 50 states. We're probably at about 17, 18 states right now. And again, if you wanna be a part of this work, we need all hands on deck. There is no reason why an individual can't be a part of, of, of multiple entities. And we like to say, as we like to say, before you're a Republican, before you're a Democrat, before you're independent, you were black. And there's nothing wrong with black folks censoring the needs of black folk. And there's nothing wrong with us owning our politics. You can be affiliated with whomever you want to, but understand even before you were part of the Working Families Party, you were black. So again, it's important and imperative for that matter for us to support our own and make sure that our voices are heard and our needs are centered and met. Dr. Bellamy, you know, to your point, I believe in another interview, you said that allies are invited, welcomed, and important mm -hmm. to the movement of our Black Party. So yes. um, talk about that, because like, I know you're centering Black voices, obviously, but still opening up to those, you know, to, to an ally, white allies, and et cetera. Yeah, as my sister, who is a lot smarter than I, she often says, Candace always, excuse me, Mayor Hollingsworth often says that we know there is no movement for black folk that has been elevated and pushed to the heights in which we wanted to be without the help of our allies and accomplices. So we are firmly aware that there is a need for everybody to play a role, but we understand and we are very steadfast in the fact that if you want to be a part of this movement, you can be uh, white, you can be Latinx, you can come from whatever culture or ethnicity or identify however you want, but you must be willing to center the needs of black folk. And you must, we must ensure that you are valuing us in our politics first. And that is, again, of the utmost importance specifically for a movement like this to move forward. We need accomplices. And I'm not, I'm gonna go a step further than just having allies. We need accomplices. We need people who are willing to put their time, their talent, their treasures on the line. We need individuals who are willing to say, I'm willing to stand in the gap with not just my words, but my actions for those who we know have been uh, just really wrecked the most by the current systems that we have in place historically. And if you're willing to do that, then this is the party for you. But for black folk, before we worry about what anyone else is going to do, for black folk, it is time again for us to own our politics and let's do this together. Yeah. Um, Sister Candace or Candace. the mayor, pardon me. Um, so I, I have a thing I've said on the show a couple of times, which is we can't even get all black folks to agree that sugar does not belong on grits. How are we gonna have <laughs> So <laughs> We're not even going to agree on this call because I grew up in Memphis and my mama put sugar on her grits oh, and I eat sugar on my man. grits, okay? So that's a of wheat. Hey, yo, you just started some division within this party because I didn't know that, Candace, and now I'm kind of looking at you a little funny because you put mm. sugar on your grits. That means we reflect all of us. <laughs> oh, man. Uh -huh. Can we all okay. agree that Crown Royal is the Lord's elixir? Can we do that? I've never had Crown Royal. Come on, me either. Me either. So here we go. <laughs> Yo, you see, we, you, you got beef. Stay, hey, man, what y'all brought me on this show? Stanley Bo my, the our own part. of my knowledge on Crown Royal is that it's a marble bag. <laughs> it's where you, it's the bag, bag you put your marbles in. That's <laughs> <laughs> Might be aging myself. Um, but, here, but yeah, go ahead. I think you have a, you have an excellent point, and um, it is one that is very salient at this point in time in particular, because what we are seeing right now, um, at, at the same time as we see um, so many Black people getting involved, period, we're also seeing a divergence in thought, um, or at least a public divergence of thought, because we know that we've always had diversity in political opinion, right? But we have, you know, black conservative movement that is growing and gaining traction in a way that I think um, has we have not publicly seen in at least not in recent years. Um, and at the same time, we also have a very radical, in a good way, in my view, I don't view radical as negative, very radical and left leaning, um, if we're talking about politics, the political spectrum, left leaning politics for black folks. And we are not going to agree on everything, period, even amongst left-leaning Black folks, even among Black conservatives. But I think 
the thing that we have to come to grips with and be okay with knowing is that there are gonna be some black folks for whom their experience in, in America and in white America is only going to be from an individualist perspective. And then there are groups of, there are those of us who their experience is individual, but also colored and influenced by what happens with the collective and everyone else. And I think the work that we're doing is focusing on those who have the, this collective vision for black folks and recognize that while, no, I may not necessarily you know, need universal income or my family may not necessarily need one of these particular policy areas, I know that there is someone else out here for whom their life will be substantially better because of that policy. And because of that, I want to stand up for them. And so I think that's how we have to start first with those who have that mindset and then navigate the, the contours of policy and how different things may deviate from one, one side to the other within that first starting with that first starting point. Yeah, may I follow up on that? Yeah, so I think this this question is twofold because I can just tell you, I can assure you, just in the short time that we've had the party up and running, we kicked off and launched officially in July. Candace and I have known each other for a few years now, but we spent um, a great deal of time together over these past few months. I've learned a great deal about her, just about, or excuse me, from her about how different and complex Black folk are as a whole. And I think uh, just serving as a professor and a quote unquote department chair and whatever, all these other titles, we know that black folk are not a monolithic group. We are a group that is extremely diverse. Like my brother, uh, Brandon, he walking up beside me right now, right? Like we, we, we're, all, we're all very diverse group of people and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with us having different thought. And in fact, um, opposed to us sometimes looking at this from, from a perspective, I'm not saying this is what you're doing, uh, brother Stanley, I'm just saying in general, opposed from us looking at us not always agreeing on everything as a negative, in fact, it would be more advantageous for us to see that as a positive because with differentiation of thought comes new ideas, comes a, a much more progressive way and not just from a political perspective, but a more progressive way of us doing things because we can address the needs of a wide variety of different people. And then lastly, I'll just say, when we, when we ask that question, and I, and I wanna be clear, brother, I'm not saying this at you. This is something that a lot of people think about, like we can't all get on the same page. I often think about or retort it with, well, well do we ask, White Republicans, do they all agree on the exact same thing? Because there's differentiation in thought within uh, white people amongst the Latino community, amongst the Asian community, amongst any other culture, ethnicity, subset of group, subset group of people, there's differentiation in thought. No one thinks the exact same about everything. And I think sometimes we have to, we're, we're a little more challenging or we're a little more difficult and hard on ourselves because we think or we have an expectation that because we may speak up and vocalize our disagreements publicly, that means that we're wrong or there's more attention that's based on it. But white supremacy is really what, in my opinion, white supremacy is truly what makes us think that we should not uh, have disagreements. White supremacy is what makes us think that if we talk about things in a way that may be unsavoring to other folk, that is bad. But in fact, we don't all again have to agree because we're all black. We have some shared experiences, but a lot of us have different experiences. So let's utilize our differences to be able to move our people forward. The other thing, if I may, the other thing that I will contribute to that is that um, when we, I think people bristle up when they hear black agenda, because there's like, well, what, what is a black agenda? What is that? And, I, and, and we have to remember that our, for many of us, our perspective on what black means is colored by years of being fed negative information, negative thoughts around what it means to be black and to stand up for being black. Mm -hmm. And so there is just an intellectual exercise that has to happen, you know, from just understanding, okay, why, why does black offend even me? You know, why, why, why am I hesitant to talk about what a black agenda is when I can talk about a progressive agenda? Or I can talk about <laughs> you know, these other things. And mm -hmm. in terms of agreement, you know, policy work is about examining unintended consequences, right? And even on councils, you know, Wes has this experience, I have this experience, I'm sure you've seen it in the areas where you live. You may have a progressive body on a council or, you know, a legislature, and yet they still disagree on the how. 
And I think that's where we are when we're talking about addressing the, the, the diversity and thought among black people. I think every, I'm pretty sure the majority of black folks would say, yes, everyone deserves to live in a safe community. Everyone deserves to have the income they need to, to feed their family. Everyone deserves to have health care. Then you get to the how, right? And so when we start to unpack what are the things that make people uncomfortable with certain um, policy proposals that may be considered socialist or too progressive, we start to create policies that are better and more sound because you address, well, this could possibly happen. And so and when I think about what could possibly happen, I can fine tune a policy proposal to make it better so that those things don't happen or you know, to limit the, the possibility of those things happening. So I think like Wes said it brilliantly that having that, those disagreements on the how makes everything that we're doing stronger. And if we make mm -hmm. sure that the work that we're doing brings in so many more people who may think differently than I do, than Wes does, um, then we have a policy platform that is gonna be able to withstand a lot more um, bullets thrown at it than we would if it were just people who all thought the same. Um, I wanna get your thoughts on third party candidates. Um, Dr. Bellamy, um, I know this is obviously uh, our black party is now on the ballot in this election, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that would be a goal to become a third party, correct me if I'm wrong. And it, what do you guys, how do you guys think that would impact future elections moving forward? Well, we're, we're very clear. We have a, a 527 political designation, which essentially allows us to do a, a wide variety of different things. And we have been steadfast in our commitment to saying that we will move as the culture needs us to, we will move as our people need us to. Um, currently, when you look at, as you just alluded to, the, the 2020 presidential election, no, we don't have any ballot status. We're not running anyone in any uh, 2020 races. And in fact, what we're making sure that we're doing is, is building up our quote unquote political army and make, making sure that we have our stuff in order, which is again, why we need everybody to come on board, www.ourblackparty.org so that we can build out across the country. When you look at specifically getting ballot status and running candidates in the future, I think it's something that black folk have to be able and be willing to look at. Um, again, you've seen this with a multitude of different folks um, in, in different entities, Working Families Party, Tea Party and so forth. Although some will say the Tea Party all just ran their, their uh, individuals under the Republican Party, we saw them shift kind of the political landscape in that regard. So we, uh, in, in Mayor, Kent, Mayor Hollingsworth, please correct me, um, or feel free to jump in. We feel as if, again, we will shift as the culture needs us to, but the time in which Black folk have been having their vote taken for granted is over. We are very clear in that regard. We are not going to allow our vote to be given away for an Instagram picture and someone coming and saying a couple of words at church on Sunday and, and, and providing some pizza and maybe some chicken. Those days are over. We will not be taken for granted. Our policy issues will be met. And our Black Party is here to ensure that that happens. What does a win look like, um, Mayor, Mayor Hollings? Like, what does a win look like for this for this new party? Hollingsworth. Pardon me, Hollingsworth. Thank you. Please, just Candace. But I appreciate <laughs> you both. Um, <laughs> um, so wins look different at different points in time. Okay. So... Right now, when we're leading up to presidential election and we're leading up to inauguration of hopefully a new president, a different president, um, then a win looks like having people engaged and having people tapped in and connected with the party. So it's about growing the numbers. Over the year, over 2021, the wins, bless you. The wins for us, bless you. <laughs> the wins for us look like um, creating state coalitions and local coalitions and developing local ballots where we begin to reorient the conversation for voters to not just say, okay, is this person a Democrat? Okay, because and I'm, we're using it as an example because we know that's where the majority of black voters um, place their vote. Beyond saying, is this person a Democrat? Okay, I'm gonna vote for the Democrat. Wanting people to see, okay, well, where do they sit on these issues? And for us being able to provide to voters in those local areas, a list of candidates and where they stand on a grading scale, if you will, 
um, for the areas that are within the Black agenda. So does this person support universal health care, but they don't necessarily support basic income? At least you know that. And I can, I can probably make an educated guess that all of us on this phone don't, or on this call don't necessarily know where our local elected officials stand on different elements of the Black agenda, right? And I imagine we're all consider ourselves pretty tapped in, pretty tuned in to local politics. So think about the person who spends their day primarily thinking about how they're getting to work, how they're gonna make sure their kids are educated and fed. That's probably the lowest on their list. So if we can make it easier for voters to be educated about the issues and educated about issues related to black people and over time starting to grow the number of folks who have a political acumen that is beyond what we probably imagine right now, to the point where in 2022 and through 2024, we have a groundswell of new people who are so engaged that they are interested in running for office themselves. Mm -hmm. And that they have started to, um, that we've started to connect with them, that we're starting to help mobilize their communities to support their runs for office, and that they're able to take, the pl take places within their local bodies and run on an unapologetically and unequivocal Black agenda. So Paul Tapper Young on Facebook says, yeah, it's over. We will not turn the other cheeks. He added, we are not our ancestors. All of our ancestors were not turned the other cheek. There were a number of revolts and riots. I just want to point that out. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we let you go, I want to know, so, you know, our Black Party started earlier this year. I know it's still very new in formation. But would you support either of the main candidates in the presidential run right now with the party endorse Biden or Trump? So for us, we lead with policy first and with their commitment to black agenda. We have developed our questionnaire that we will provide to the Biden campaign and to Trump campaigns based on what we've seen, um, just from, from my perspective, personal perspective, based on what I've seen, the, the platform that is closest to the items in the black agenda are those from the Biden campaign. However, they are still incredibly far from what is necessary for realizing the black agenda. So I wanna make that very clear. And at this point in time, we also need to talk about it and, and many organizers um, and activists also talk about this concept of harm reduction, right? And voting as an act of harm reduction. And in this case, we know there is the, the gradation of harm is much greater with, with um, the president that is currently in office than it is with the one that we, are, with, that we see forward. Um, when you look at President Trump's black agenda, it is what's called the platinum plan. Mm -hmm. It is offensive um, in many ways because it, it, they are platitudes and none of it describes any policy positions that are actually going to be able to improve the lives of black people. Um, and even one of the major ones that, that, or the easy ones that we could talk about, which is um, considering white supremacy groups as terrorists, right? That's on the platinum plan and we couldn't get the president to condemn white supremacy in a debate. So I'm very, <laughs> it leaves little room for me to believe that that is a genuine, that is a genuine black, black agenda for black people in this country from his from his position. Um, okay, well, no, that being said, we actually do have to start to bring this conversation to a close, but before we end, um, I do wanna just ask Dr. Bellamy, if you could tell us, I mean, again, a black agenda is something that we've been talking about for decades, for generations. Um, it almost sounds almost like cliche at this point, but what steps, what is it really going to take for us to number one, define it, come together collectively around it, and then push it into policy and concrete legislation? Well, we would encourage everybody to visit our website, www.ourblackparty.org. You will see the Black to the Future Black Agenda on our website. You'll see some of the, you'll see many, excuse me, the breakdown of what it looks like. You'll also see our policy positions in terms of what it looks like. There are also tangible ways in which we take that agenda and turn it into policy. So for the sake of time, we don't want to get too long-winded here. We just, again, encourage everyone to visit read the information for yourself as online. But I would just leave with, with us saying this, black agendas are incredibly important. What's more important in my personal estimation in the black agenda is us committing ourselves to saying that we're willing to do something. The political education is of the utmost importance. Us ensuring that we are engaged in the political process is of the utmost importance. Rallying around each other and not throwing each other under the bus, i.e. we are not our ancestors, 
is political, excuse me, is incredibly important. So how we respect each other, how we value each other, how we love each other, and how we pay homage to those who are currently doing the work and those who did the work before us, all of that is just as important as this building up a political future, building up our political agenda. And again, if you want to see more about how we're doing it, we need you to join us, www.ourblackparty.org. You can follow us on social media at Our Black Party on all uh, social media platforms. That's Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And we really want to thank you all for having us on the call today. Shout out to Black Enterprise. Shout out to my sister, Selena, and brother Stanley. Thank you all so much. Absolutely. And Mayor Hollingsworth, did you have any final words on pushing a Black agenda into fruition? It's, it, it is first beginning with knowing and believing that the vision that we see is possible um, and getting connected to our Black party. Um, and then just working with us where we can build it together. Because the Black agenda that exists now is just a starting point. It is by no means, you know, going to be the destination, but we can, but we can actually build it together through community input and reimagine politics for what we know our communities need and is actually going to move our communities forward. Thank and not you. thinking it has to be done tomorrow. <laughs> like this, this, these, the issues that we have in our community weren't created yesterday or last year or last month. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be solved tomorrow. This is a marathon. We all love to, to quote Nipsey with a wide variety of different things. And as he says, the marathon continues. So let's pass the baton to each other and run this marathon, not just think that it's a hundred meter dash. Let's do the hard work of being sustainable and making sure that we bring these policy agendas to fruition. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, Candace. No. I just, I just had to say that. No, it's all yes, good. Did. Um, Stan, <laughs> did you want to um, also, I want to get your final thoughts on the topic that we talked about, our Black Party and a Black agenda. Black Party, Black agenda is very important. If there's one thing that, one lesson that folks should have learned from the Republican Party over the last four years is this is a power game. And the Republican Party will do anything to hold power and then use that power, make it active, because power is useless if you're passive. So, a black agenda is important, the black party is important to build that power and then not just hold it, but then to use it to get to change the material conditions in the lives of black and brown people and black people all over the diaspora. Good, Stanley. So you're gonna sign up. You already signed up now. <laughs> Got you. There we go. I want to thank you guys again. Um, check out our black party.com. We appreciate not only the time that you spent with us today, but the work you are doing in the community. And I just want to leave everyone with this final takeaway. The old system is not working. We tried it for centuries, you know, decades. It's been a long time. The system was not built for us. I'm 100% ready to try something new. And I salute my brothers and my sisters, particularly Candace and Dr. Bellamy for coming on today and, and, and starting this new thing and giving life to a new political organization. I think a lot of us are so tired of the way things have been going and we're protesting and marching in the streets. But I do feel like the next step is us galvanizing around, um, you know, having an organization that we can galvanize around and come together and actually push for things, taking it to the next level. So check it out, Our Black Party, follow it, sign up, donate. One of the followers, when somebody actually commented on Facebook, they said they're going to donate today. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. And we appreciate your time. We'll see you again next Sunday.